Thank you, everyone, and uh, particularly thank you to uh, Dave for inviting me to come and speak to you today. Um, the topic that we talked about is um, managing pain in myeloma patients, and as Dave mentioned, it's obviously a very common symptom or problem that uh, affect many of the patients here. So I would like to use the next 30, 45 minutes to talk about what I do and how I can help patients manage their pain. And I understand there will be a question and answer period later on. Um, so maybe we'll save the questions for the very end, but hang on to your thoughts. I'm sure there'll be many questions later on. So quickly, just about what I'll talk about with you all today. Um, first, I'll just sort of explain what is palliative care. Why is a palliative care doctor here today to speak to you about pain management? Um, what does that concept of quality of life mean? Um, we'll talk about symptom management, and of course, in particular, we'll focus on pain um, in multiple, multiple, multiple myeloma. So what is palliative care? Do any of you know? Maybe I'll quiz you a little bit. What do you think about or feel when people say to you the name palliative care? I, I heard death. End of, life. End of life, yeah. We're all palliative because we are on our way to death. Oh, okay. So interesting thought. We're all palliative because we're all uh, end of life. Uh, I guess there's a saying, right? We're all dying the day we're born. Um, so very interesting um, thoughts from the group that most of us, when we think of palliative care, we think of death and dying, uh, illness, and anything that's very you know, morbid and unpleasant to think about. So maybe here I'll question you a little bit more. This question is a true or false question. Referring, to a, pa referring a patient to palliative care means that the doctor has given up on the patient. Is that true or false? False. Okay, I'm overwhelmingly hearing false. Interesting, when we think about death and dying, mostly about palliative care, and then there's a false here in the room. Okay, so the second question. Palliative care should only be introduced when there are no cancer treatments available, or it will take away hope from the patient. True or false? False. false. Again, mostly false. I'm impressed with you all. So we'll explore a little bit more what exactly is palliative care. This is the definition from the World Health Organization, and it says palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families who are facing problems associated with life-threatening illness. And we do that by prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification, assessment and treatment of pain and other physical, spiritual, and psychosocial problems. Well, a lot of word, but I think the most uh, important concepts here I highlighted in green is that what we do with the aim of improving the quality of life for patients and their families, and we do that by prevention and relief of suffering. So who do we serve? Who do we look after? Well, a lot of our patients, of course, are cancer patients, and these are cancer patients who have solid tumors like breast and lung cancers, but also the blood type cancers like leukemia, like myeloma. But we also look after patients with heart disease, such as heart failure, lung disease like COPD, late stage liver or kidney disease, um, even patients who are on dialysis or pre-dialysis, those patients who've had an organ transplantation or waiting for one to happen, and also patients with neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease or even HIV and AIDS patients. Now, because I work at a cancer center, of course, all of my patients are cancer patients, but the scope of palliative care does uh, include all these different patients with various illnesses. So what do we do when I see my patient in my clinic? Well, what we do are three things, mostly. The first one is symptom management and supportive care. And symptoms can be different types. There are physical symptoms like pain and shortness of breath. But there are also emotional symptoms uh, like depression and anxiety, feeling sad, feeling worried. Uh, and there are also spiritual level of symptoms as well, a concept what we call existential grief. People struggling with the idea, why do I have a life-threatening illness and why do I have all these different symptoms that really make me feel bad? The second thing we do is we um, find out what the patient and the family needs are and then we refer them and connect them with community service agencies or any relevant support services. And finally, we help people 
discuss advanced care planning. We create a care plan for the future, no matter what their health status is, that we have a plan for them and their family so nobody's caught in a pinch or in a crisis. It really is a holistic approach. We're putting the patient in the center there, and we're trying to support not only them, but people around them, like the family, their friends, um, and other formal caregivers, including the doctors, nurses, but also volunteers. And also we're trying to foster um, a relationship so that we um, basically encircle the patient and the family as a unit. And we look at all the different domains, the physical, the emotional, the social, and even cultural and um, uh, religious domains as well. Now, of course, there's no way one person or a doctor can do all of that. So usually when you are seen by palliative care, it's a team. The patient and the family is the most important person in that team. And then we have the doctors, the nurses, uh, the pharmacists who can give advice on medication. Uh, we have social workers who help look at community services available uh, and relevant to people. The physio and occupational therapists that sit down with the patient and find out what activities are meaningful and important to them and how we can support them to continue doing these activities in a safe and comfortable fashion so they are still independent. Music therapy, um, spiritual care, these look after sort of the spiritual domain of life. Sometimes we consult a dietitian as well if we need advice on nutritional support. Um, volunteers, I think, um, you know, many organizations out there are voluntary agencies and really our patients um, get well looked after by this support. And of course, um, community services agencies as well, such as home care or formerly known as CCAC, Community Care Access Center. Now, it used to be um, people will only get referred to health care in a very late stage in the illness. Um, if you look at the top picture there, the light blue is when people are on curative treatment. So they're seen by the specialist and they do all the treatments available. And when there are no other treatments that can use to treat the underlying illness, be it cancer or other things, then the specialist may say, okay, well, I'm sorry, I don't have anything else I can do for you. I'm gonna refer you to palliative care. The problem with that though is although palliative care doctors are specialists in looking after patients, um, for the patients, they feel a very strong sense of abandonment. Right? It feels very much like the doctors are like, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. Here you go off to somebody else. That's not very helpful when you're in a stage of illness, when you feel very ill, very um, vulnerable. And to have to meet new people and establish new relationships, um, it really doesn't add to their care. And unfortunately, also for the specialists, the palliative care doctors, we only have a very short time to get to know the person uh, and to look after them before they may die of their illness. And then a lot of times, because we have such a short relationship with them, our time with them ends when the person passes on as well. So there's no follow-up care. In the last 20 to 30 years, however, people have sort of rethink this approach to care. Is there more we can do to help add value to people's life, to make them live better, feel better, and also do better? And this is where the new model appears, where health care starts to be involved early on. We may start off with a very small role in the beginning, but as we get to know the person over time, and as the illness changes, we can play a more active role. And what is the most important piece is we work with the specialists in a partnership. So this is a bigger team. We're enlarging the team that encircles the patient to look after them in the best way possible. And because then we have the chance to build up a longer term relationship with the patient and the family, even after the death of the patient, we can continue to support the family with bereavement services. So you may ask, when can palliative care be, be involved in the person's care? Well, there is the idea of early integration, which we'll talk a little bit more. So meeting the patient at the time of their diagnosis, very, very early on, but we can also be involved when there are symptoms that affect the quality of life of the patients. When the illness is progressing and it is um, creating new symptoms or distress, particularly we mentioned emotional, spiritual distress. So why do we suggest incorporating or in integrating palliative care earlier on in patients' illness? Well, this is a study that was done in Boston in the States um, in, in and about 2009, 2010. This is a group that looked at 
a bunch of new cancer patients. They are diagnosed with stage four lung cancer patients. So these um, stage four lung cancers had spread already outside of the lungs at the time of being diagnosed with the cancer. And this is an incurable situation. So they separated all the patients into two groups. The first group get the routine type of care, chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, whatever is appropriate. The second group get all those same treatments, all the standard treatment, plus meeting PALS care earlier on. And then they compare at the end of it what happens to the two groups. Well, what they found was that patients who have the PALS care services involved, they have an improved quality of life. And more surprisingly to everyone, these patients lived longer. I'll take a moment to let that sink in. I think a lot of people, including the researchers, were quite surprised that palliative care actually made people live longer, counter to the impression or even the stigma that most people have about palliative care being end-of-life care. At that time, from that study, those patients who had palliative care lived longer by just under three months. You may think that's not a whole lot, but actually at that time, back in 2010, with the available treatments then, that is actually better than any chemotherapy the doctors can give to a stage four lung cancer at that point. Meaning, palliative care service at that time made patients live longer than the chemo that the doctors were giving them. So that was quite a revolutionary finding. So what other people did then was to try and explore what happens then outside of just lung cancer patients. So here at Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto, where I work, I was a part of this study actually, we were looking at a group of all different kinds of cancer patients. So over 400 of them, um, they're all solid tumor patients. So they include breast cancer, lung cancer, um, urinary cancer. So for example, bladder and kidney cancer, uh, gynecological cancers, and that would include ovarian or um, uterine cancers and digestive tract cancers. So, you know, um, stomach, uh, pancreas or esophageal cancer. So a, a whole different types of cancer and we did the same thing. We had a group that just got all the standard treatment, another group with the standard treatment plus meeting the palliative care team early on. And we were seeing these patients every month to help with their symptoms. What happened at the end of that study was patients, again, had an improved quality of life. They had better symptom control and management. And they also were more satisfied with their care that they got. Now this time around, we didn't see that the patients lived longer but that may be because we have so many different types of cancer and we know some, of, some cancers are more aggressive than others. So perhaps the benefit to survival or to longevity is diluted out. At this stage, most of the research on palliative care and early palliative care integration um, is done on solid tumor patients. There's only a, a limited amount of research done on hematological or blood type cancers. Uh, and there may be many reasons for that. I'm not going to go into them in too, too many details, but really I think blood type cancer patients have different needs and different types of symptoms from solid tumors. Uh, but there are now an interest in looking at what happens when we incorporate palliative care earlier on in the course of illness for blood type cancers, including myeloma patients. So hopefully more to come. And maybe at some point we can come back and share with you the updates on research in palliative care for myeloma patients. So, again, I'll just ask you guys a question. What does quality of life mean to you? Yes. Yeah. A couple of very good points made by the audience member here that quality of life can mean different things to different people, and that's very true. And one thing he mentioned is, you know, um, to live as well as you can. Um, and I think that's very important. He also mentioned, you know, it is living according to my own values. It could be values that are different from others. And that's, again, highlighting the individuality of quality of life. 
Any, anything that makes you think of good quality of life for you then? Living with less pain. Living with less pain, absolutely. It's very important. Any other examples you can think of? Yes? Maintaining your identity. Maintaining your identity. That's a very uh, abstract but very important one as well, isn't it? Mobility. Mobility, okay. So all those things may be part of your identity, isn't it? Being able to stay mobile or independent. Anything else you can think of? Final one, yes? Oh, being able to plan for trips, so to be able to travel, I guess, right? To do other things that you enjoy. I think those are all great things. So as you have all said, it really is a concept that includes many domains, right? It includes your physical health, so the, the pain, um, emotional health, your level of independence, your social relationship with others, and also your personal values and faith, as that uh, gentleman said in the beginning. So some of the examples that I, I got listening to other groups when I presented to them before, so in terms of the physical domain, it could be eating what you can, what you want to, what you love, uh, being able to sleep well, living without pain. As Bob said, emotional domain includes maybe feeling cheerful and not worrying, um, not feeling anxious. And on a spiritual level, maintaining an active social life, you know, going on trips, um, and feeling or living unburdened, feeling that you are who you are, maintaining your own identity. Does that make sense to all of you? Yeah. So, how do we help improve quality of life for our patients? Well, the biggest thing that we do from the Path Care Service is to manage your symptoms. Some of these common symptoms we see, pain being a very big one, but also shortness of breath, nausea, constipation, uh, low appetite, feeling fatigued or tired, feeling drowsy, the two things are not necessarily the same, or the opposite, not being able to sleep, suffering from insomnia, but also in mood, uh, in terms of depression and anxiety. So these are some of the symptoms we help patients with. Now, <laughs> on to our feature presentation, right? Pain. You may or may not agree with Linus's wisdom here, because I think sometimes it's hard to look at someone who's in pain, especially if you're a family member, your caregiver. Or it could be it's hard to look at yourself when you're suffering from pain. So just in general, pain in cancer can be caused by the cancer itself, but also treatments of cancer. And sources of pain can include coming from our bones, from our muscles, our internal organs, or even other soft tissues. There is a particular type of pain I want to mention called neuropathic pain or nerve pain. It is mostly due to cancer um, invasion into the nerves or sometimes a treatment complications. It could be your chemotherapy, radiation or surgery uh, in that they are stimulating or injuring the nerves. And it is harder to control. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later on when we get into the medications. So in general, how do we manage cancer-related pain? Well, first we have to find out exactly where the pain is coming from, how does it cause the type of pain that the person has. And based on that, we create a personalized treatment plan. If it's due to cancer invasion, then maybe radiation or surgery could be helpful. And of course, taking medications or analgesics is directed to help with the pain. If the pain is coming from treatment side effects, then we may have to look at adjusting the treatment. For example, if it's due to the chemo, then you may need to reduce the dose of the chemo drug or even switch the drug. But of course, this should be discussed with your hematologist and oncologist first. And again, taking pain medication as directed. Specifically for myeloma patients, pain is a big problem. Dave mentioned that in the beginning. Um, in one of the uh, review research, it was found that up to 73% of myeloma patients have pain of some type, of some degree or severity throughout their illness. How many of you have had, had pain while you had myeloma or dealing with pain right now? Yeah, quite a few of us, right? Yeah. There we are. So the pain, again, uh, can come from different parts in the body. Most often it's from the bony involvement in the myeloma. Uh, of those patients who have bony involvement, up to 80 or even 90% of them have pain because of that. And of course, because the bones are involved by the myeloma, there is a higher risk of 
a, what we call a pathological fracture. If the bones break, there will be a lot of pain. But you can also have soft tissue pain as well from the plasmacytoma. We know plasmacytomas are a clump of these abnormal blood cells, uh, and they can collect in different parts of our body. I had patients where they have plasmacytomas in the shoulder muscle area or in the, mus uh, in the stomach area, so it can cause different types of soft tissue pain or even internal organ-related pain. Both of these involvement, whether it's soft tissue or bony involvement, can have a neuropathic component, so a nerve pain with it. Because we have nerves wrapping around the bones, we have nerves in our soft tissues. So you can see very early on that there can be different types of pain in multiple myeloma patients. And that is important. We differentiate these different types so we can treat them appropriately. Um, some of the treatments for myeloma can also cause a neuropathy or the nerve damage. Right? Um, Valcade or bortezomib is one of those. Um, it's talked about a lot when you look at the research in nerve damage in myeloma patients. Uh, but Dave also reminded me that thalidomide that we, we use, um, maybe less so now, but in the past we used quite a bit of thalidomide, um, that can also cause um, neuropathy or that nerve pain. Uh, and they can linger on for a long, long time, even years for our patients. So how can we manage pain? Well, first off, I want to talk about things that you guys can do for yourself. Self-management is a, is a big thing now in managing chronic illnesses. So the first thing is be mindful of your pain. When you have the pain, pay attention to it. When did it first start? Where is it? How would you describe this pain? Would you call it a sharp pain, a dull pain, an achy pain, like a toothache? Is there a throbbing, burning, tingling, gnawing? Is there itching? All these types of descriptors or adjectives or things you can use to describe it will always be helpful to your doctors and nurses to figure out what type of pain we're dealing with. How long does this pain last when it starts? Does it go away on its own or do you have to do something to help it? to go away. What makes it worse? And again, what makes it better? Um, very importantly, how does this pain affect your ability to do things for yourself? How does it affect your activity level? These are all questions your doctors and nurses will ask you when you tell them you have pain. So sometimes keeping a pain diary could be helpful. Very importantly, if you have pain, a new pain, tell your doctor because then we have to look into what's going on. Where is this pain coming from? And especially if it's a sudden pain. It wasn't there a minute ago, but you bent down to put on your socks and now you've got a really bad, bad pain in your back. Definitely call your doctors right away because it could be a pathological fracture. I'm sure that has happened to someone at some point. Um, I don't pay much attention to this because I haven't thought that anything could be done about it. Like I have um, pain across here, which I, and a lot of it I think is likely um, exercise related. Mm -hmm. So, what what can the doctor do? If I, I mean, I see the doctor now once a month, but what can she do? So there's a question in the front here about pain, especially pain that's been there for a long time now. It's a chronic pain. What can the doctors do for them? And is it important even to report all these pains? Um, good thought. I would park that thought for now. We're going to go into the rest of it and we'll talk about exactly what the doctors can do for your pain. And I know that we have the question and answer period at the end as well. So we'll share all the questions at the very end too. Um, certainly remind me if I haven't answered your questions that you have in your mind later on. Um, I think very importantly though, the one thing I would address is if you had chronic pain, um, yes, it's hard to decide if I tell that to my doctor every time I see them, yeah, I still got that same pain that's been there for years. But I think the, the important thing from the last slide is if you have a new pain, certainly make sure that your doctor know about it or if a sudden pain, especially. So again, what can you help uh, to, to look after your, your pain? Um, I'm glad Dave mentioned that the, one of the upcoming speakers is a kinesiologist talking about activity, physical exercises for myeloma patients because actually there is very good research to support staying physically active helps with pain. 
we would suggest starting with light to moderate intensity activities, such as walking or a stationary bike. These are safe for everybody, no matter how advanced your disease can be. The experts suggest being careful with weightlifting because if you have a lot of bony involvement, the action involved with weightlifting can actually cause a fracture, and we don't want that, of course. And perhaps sometimes it may be helpful to speak to a kinesiologist or kinesiologist or a physiotherapist um, for expert advice. What is the right type of exercise program for myself, given the type of illness I have and the bony involvement I have? Um, Dave also mentioned that there are survivorship programs in many different cancer centers. And a lot of these survivorship programs have physiotherapists and occupational therapists for that specific reason, to advise people what kind of physical activity is helpful for you and safe for you. The bottom line, however, is any level of physical activity is beneficial. So rather than sitting in the chair for all day, try to get up and do something. Even just walking around in the living room, making a cup of tea for yourself, doing a little bit of light household chores can still be an adequate amount of physical activity to help you stay active and you get the benefit from it. The other thing to know too is the benefit of one long stretch of activity is exactly the same as if you have broken it up into smaller, shorter stretches. So if you do a 30 minute walk and you're really, really tired after that and you can't do anything for several hours, you have to lay on the couch afterwards, don't do that. Separate that into three sessions of 10 minute walk, if all you can do is 15 minutes, so don't go beyond the 15 minutes, do the 10 minutes, but you spread it out throughout the day. The good thing about that is now you've created an exercise program for yourself that you're engaged in throughout the day. So you're active morning, afternoon, and evening. You're also not overexerting. You're not going over your body's limit. Listen to your body. If you know you're gonna get tired at some point, don't get to that point rest before you do and then come again later on and try the same activity and do short bursts of them. The value is the same so there's no need to push yourself too hard but again the bottom line is stay active because it's very helpful to help manage your pain and decrease the stiffness you may get. The more you sit the more you stay lying down and sedentary the more difficult it is for you to get out of that rut basically. <coughs> Other things you can do for yourself or your pain um, that does not involve medications or drugs. Mindfulness, again, that was mentioned earlier, uh, or meditation, different types of um, techniques you can use. And there are many internet resources out there to teach you how to do mindfulness. Um, again, many of the survivorship programs actually have classes um, or groups that you can join to help you build some mindfulness techniques that you can use. Distraction, quote and unquote, um, is another big um, sort of way to help with managing pain, chronic pain especially. So it includes things like breathing exercises. Maybe it's something we can practice together right now. So if you can all take a deep breath in through your nose, as slowly and as deeply as you can to expand your lungs in through your nose and then hold it. Don't breathe out yet. Count one, one thousand, two, one thousand. And now you blow out through your mouth like you're blowing out the candle as slowly and as long as you can. When you feel your lungs empty, now you take another breath in through your nose. Slow in, expand your lungs, hold it. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. And now you breathe out, blowing out the candle as slow as you can. And this is the box breathing technique. You just learned it. You can see how it's like a box, right? Because you take a breath in and then you hold it for a few seconds and then you breathe out. What these breathing exercises do is they force you to focus the brain's attention on your breathing rhythm, on the way you breathe, and takes your attention off the pain. Pain, if you will, is a protection mechanism of the body. It tells us something is wrong. There's something hurting us and we need to run away from it. And that's all well and good if it's something like if we touch a burning stove, we want to take our hand away quickly. But if it's a chronic pain from myeloma, from cancer, it may not go away that quickly. So if we don't deal with the pain, 
the brain feels that you're ignoring the alarm bells. So what it does is it turns it up. It makes the pain worse until you finally do something to it. So we have to teach the brain not to focus on the pain. So breathing exercises is one way of doing that. Mindfulness, of course, is another way. Another thing we can try is visual imagery. It could be a guided Im uh, visual imagery, or it could be something that you do on your own. So maybe for this exercise, I'll ask you all to close your eyes and think with me that you're on a beach. What does the beach look like? Think in as many details as you can, as vividly as you can imagine it. What's the color of the sand? And do you feel the wind, the breeze on your face? Is this a beach by the lake or by the seashore? Can you feel the sand underneath your feet? Is it wet? And when you walk in the sand, what does that feel like? Can you feel the sunlight on your face? Feel the warmth? And do you hear any other sounds other than your own walking in the sand? Other than the waves? Other than the breeze? What other sounds can you hear? And you can open your eyes. So we're back in the auditorium. How does that feel? It's very easy to do, isn't it? Very easy, and you can take that anywhere you go. Whether you're in a crowded waiting room waiting to see a doctor, whether you have pain because you're sitting in bed right now, or whether it's some other places. It's a tool that you can use anytime. And again, the whole point is to let the brain's focus shift to the very comforting and relaxing scene and not on the pain. I say guided because sometimes there is a script that we can use, just like I practice with you. And an occupational therapist sometimes can be the person to walk you through it. For example, our occupational therapist in our health care clinic see our patients in appointments and do relaxation therapy sessions with them, and they go through the visual imagery. She can write up the script and record it, and also burn a copy of the music that she uses to go with it if that helps the person to manage the pain. And at this point, I should mention music therapy. A lot of people find they connect very easily to music. Of course, not everybody does that. But for those who find that they can connect to music easily, it's a great way as well to take the focus off the pain. But also people find that music can have a calming effect on them. I think most of us realize that when we have discomfort, it could be the pain, but it could also be other types of symptoms, shortness of breath, nausea. All those unpleasant symptoms can make us feel anxious because we don't feel well in ourselves. But the more anxious we feel, typically the worse our symptoms also get. So music has a way for us to get in tune with our emotions, but also if we use the right type of music, actually calm down those emotions, help us slow down our breathing rate, and again, shift our focus off the pain or other unpleasant symptoms. Art therapy does the same for us. I think uh, in the last few years, those coloring books are very uh, much in, in, in vogue, right? very popular. And we've had a lot of patients who told us when they're doing the coloring, it really helps them deal with their pain. So different modalities, different type of things you can do for yourself. And again, you can do that anywhere, basically. Other things perhaps include massage, healing touch, acupuncture, or even cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, there is no strong research to say, oh, this clearly works for cancer pain. But also, if you think about the flip side, there are usually no serious harms either. So if it, this is something that you're interested in, of course, talk to your doctors first. But most times, it is reasonable to consider these other things to help manage your pain. I will say one thing, however, for acupuncture. Um, Right now, they're not regulated, so I would say go by word of mouth, talk to people that you know, maybe get a reference, um, and also ask to make sure that the practitioner um, has treated cancer patients in the past, that they have the experience, and you feel comfortable with them. Uh, mention to them your medical status so that 
when they give the treatment, they're not being overly aggressive. Same thing for massage therapy as well. You know, I think light touch is fair, but deep tissue massages or interventions probably should be avoided, especially if you have bony involvement. We don't want too much pressure on the bones. So having said all the things uh, about you, what you can do to help yourself, I'm very interested. there's interest in the group on pain medication, which is important, right? Because a lot of times people, when they think about pain, think about medications or drugs, and, and they worry, you know, I don't really want to take more drugs. And, you know, most times that's very reasonable. We don't necessarily want to put more drugs into a person, but we would suggest medications if we feel they are helpful uh, or they're the the right thing to do for their pain, especially if the person has already done all those self-management techniques we've just talked about. So there are different types of pain medication you can use. This is a quick list, and we'll go into them in a bit more detail. Um, and common medications for pain we use include acetaminophen, which is um, Tylenol, I'm sure many of you are familiar, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, or NSAIDs as we call them. Uh, one example would be ibuprofen or Advil, the trade name. Opioids, or anything in that morphine family, um, what we call adjuvants or add-ons, and then finally bisphosphonates. Which one or types of medication you end up using depends on your illness, depends on the type of pain you have, depends on where your pains are, and also depends on your general health. So always, always check with your treating doctors first. Don't take medications on your own. And if you have to change your medications, always speak to your doctors and nurses first. So now, going into a little bit more detail for acetaminophen or Tylenol, um, it helps with low-grade pain, most often for bony type of pain. It is clear by your liver, so we have to be careful if there's some degree of liver um, dysfunction. So if the, norm, the liver's not functioning normally, we may have to use a lower dose. So that's why I check with your doctors first. The NSAIDs, the anti-inflammatories, again, may help with low-grade pain, uh, bony pain, soft tissue pain. They are cleared by your kidneys, however, and as Dave and I talked in preparing this talk, um, we, we wanted to remind you that you should talk to your doctors about that because myeloma can, of course, in itself cause uh, kidney issues. So you have to be very careful and NSAIDs may not be the appropriate pain medication for you. So check with your doctors. The other thing we have to be concerned about too is um, the anti-inflammatory are uh, somewhat antiplatelet in their in the action. And we know platelets help us clot out blood. So if you have low platelet counts as a result of your treatment and you use NSAIDs, there is a higher risk of bleeding. So again, always check with your doctors before taking these medications. Um, also, both of these type of medications can mask a fever. So if you're not feeling well, make sure you check your temperature first before you take them, because we don't want to miss the fever that may indicate an infection. Now, the next class of medication that we use very often are the opioids or anything in that morphine family. The reason is because they are the main type of medication that is the most effective for cancer-related pain. I've listed all the agents that we have available in Canada that we use commonly, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with some of the names, morphine, codeine, hydromorphone, and the brand name Dilaudid, um, oxycodone, fentanyl, and methadone. Was anybody shocked when they heard oxycodone and fentanyl? There's a lot of inches in attention right now in the media about fentanyl, right? Talk a bit more about that in a bit. But the important thing to note is different people react differently to these compounds. They're in a family, so they're related, but they're different chemicals. So if you had one of them before and you didn't react right to it, your doctor may still suggest another medication in the same family, and do not be surprised because they are different chemicals. You may still be able to use another drug in the same family even if you have issues with side effects on a previous one. However, right now our science is not good enough to tell us which medication is the best for a given person, so we have to go through a trial and error approach. We try one, we increase the dose gradually, according to the pain control or side effects. And if we get to a reasonable dose and it still doesn't help the pain, we switch and try another one and we do the same thing. We go up on the dose gradually until we help with the pain or that there are side effects and then we have to switch. 
it's frustrating for a lot of patients when they have to go through that, especially when they have a lot of pain. And we realize that. But again, right now, there isn't a better way for us to tell which medication is the best. And that's why we said earlier, keeping a pain diary is helpful. Because if you have used other pain medications in the past, it's very helpful for your doctors and nurses to know what reactions you have. Did it help your pain in any way? If it helped you, how long did it help the pain for? How long did it take to kick in to give you a benefit? And did you have any other side effects? How quickly did those side effects come up? These are all important information that help your doctors and nurses decide what medications will help treat your pain the best. Now, you may wonder what are the side effects? I've heard a lot of bad things about opioids. Well, it is true there are a lot of side effects for opioids. Uh, in particular, dry mouth, constipation, nausea, drowsiness, mental clouding, these are all things that people may experience. And you're like, well, doc, then why would anybody want to use these medications then? The good news is most of these side effects, with, with the exception of dry mouth and constipation, they tend to go away, or that the body adjusts to them, typically within a week to two. So a lot of times people are able to stay on these medications if they allow the body time to adjust to them. One of the biggest side effects that a lot of people worry about, and that's why they stop using the pain medication, is the constipation. And it is a very um, significant and very distressing symptom sometimes. I've even had patients who need to go to the emergency department or be admitted to the hospital simply because they had really bad constipation. However, it is still something that can be managed relatively easier comparing to the cancer pain. And we have many different things we can use to treat constipation. The reason why opioid pain medication cause constipation is because they slow down your bowels. Your stomach and your gut move slower, so things sit in the, in the gut and they become constipated. And the stool becomes hard, so it's harder to go. But we can counteract that by using laxatives. Well, what about you know, drinking fluids and uh, prune juice or staying active physically? Those are all good things and they will certainly help, but those alone is not enough to treat the constipation side effect. A lot of people use fiber normally when they have constipation, but I would suggest not using fiber when you're dealing with opioid or pain medication related constipation. Because the gut is already moving slower, if you put the fiber into the gut, they become a plug and actually makes your constipation worse. So that's where the laxatives would work way better because they are stimulant. They also, depending on the type of laxatives, help to soften out the stool so it's easier to go. And if you're not sure how to manage your constipation, talk to your doctors, perhaps your palliative care doctor if you have one, because we are very good at managing symptoms, including pain and constipation. And then again, uh, on the opioids, they're both, um, they cleave both by your liver and your kidneys. So that's why your doctors have to pay attention to your liver and kidney function and would advise you how to adjust your dose accordingly. And that's also why um, you should never, ever, ever change your pain medication on your own. Always speak to your doctor. They are actually very safe to use. Even the fentanyl that we've heard a lot about in the media. Unfortunately, um, the fentanyl problem is mostly due to people who are misusing the medication. If our patients are using the opioid family, according to the instructions and the directions of their doctors and nurses, it is very safe. We typically only adjust and go up on the dose if needed, if the pain is not controlled. And we also would go down on the medication if the pain is controlled or there are side effects, right? So it's always negotiable and it's helpful if you bring your concerns to the doctors and nurses rather than play around with the medications on your own. I stress that point repeatedly. You've noticed I've said that a few times already because in the last week, I've already spoken with a few patients who phoned me telling me that they're in trouble either because their pain is not controlled or they are feeling very unwell. It could be because they went up on the pain medication, the opioids on their own, and they went way faster and higher than they ought to, or that they went down or stopped the medication on their own without our suggestions. What happens if you stop them suddenly? So if you stop these opioids cold turkey, you go into withdrawal. Now that's different from addiction. 
Withdrawal is a physical, is a body's response to not having the medication in your body. Our body gets used to having the opioids after you've been taking them for a while. If you stop suddenly, you will have symptoms of feeling, you know, um, anxious, unwell, you may have a runny nose, you may feel shivery, you may have a flare-up in your pain. It's a very, very unpleasant thing to go through. It's not fatal, you won't die from it, but it's very unpleasant. And sometimes it really scares people because they don't know what's happening to them when they feel so anxious and when they feel so unwell, they're curled up in bed. And when they call us, we found out, oh, you stopped your pain medication in the last 24 hours suddenly for no apparent reason. Well, this is the, this is the reason why you feel so crummy. So don't ever do that. Don't ever stop the opioids on your own, cold turkey. Speak to your doctors and nurses. We always suggest a gradual tapering or gradual decrease in the dose to let the body get used to lower and lower amount of medications until you can finally stop them safely. And again, our approach is always to use the lowest amount of medication possible for pain. So if you don't need that much medication anymore because your pain is better, we can always talk about how to get you off of them. One final thing, these opioids are available in a long and short-acting uh, short formulations. They work in complement. The long-acting formulation helps to control the pain in the background. So keep the pain as low as possible. And then when you have a flare, you use the short-acting to bring the flare down. The short-acting pain medication kicks in very quickly, and they only last for a short time. So it helps to bring the spike of pain down, but it wouldn't last in your system to make you too drowsy. However, if you have pain throughout the day, then it makes sense that you start on a long-acting formulation so that you have the pain as low as possible throughout the day. We even it out so there are less of those peaks and valleys. Or at the very least, when you have a pain flare, it will happen less frequently. And when you have a flare, it won't be a big spike. It will be a smaller spike. So you can use less medication. Um, a big sort of general class of medication called adjuvants or add-ons, we use them when the pain is very stubborn. They don't respond to the opioids that we just spent a few minutes talking about, then we need to add on and use these other medications. Or if our patients experience side effects that they cannot tolerate from the opioids, like you know if they have a very bad dry mouth, or they actually feel they are very fuzzy with their thinking when they take the opioids, then we may have to use the add-ons, the adjuvants, because they actually make each other's effect better. They have what we call a synergistic effect. They add on to each, to each other. So when used in combination with the opioids, people get better pain relief. And we may be able to get away with using lower doses for both. So that may also mean fewer side effects. Typically, when people have neuropathic pain or the nerve pain, this pain is very stubborn. If you only use opioids, a lot of people find that's not good enough for their pain. And that's when we would suggest using the add-ons, the adjuvants on top of that. The whole purpose, as we said, is to see if we can get away with using less medication. So as much as it's counterintuitive that we're adding on another drug, the purpose is so that the total amount of drug is lower in the end for you. There are different types of adjuvants we use. The first big type is the anti-epileptics or anti-seizure medications. Some of you might have heard of these names or are already on them now, gabapentin or pregabalin. Anybody on them, actually? Yeah, exactly. Right? Um, another big group is the antidepressants. So there are different types of antidepressants we use for neuropathic pain or stubborn pain, uh, and they include the class called tricyclic antidepressant or uh, another one called duloxetine. Um, a lot of times, of course, our patients, because of the chronic pain, have a low mood as a result. So using an antidepressant as an add-on may have the added benefit of killing two birds with one stone. We're catching the pain, but we're also catching the mood symptoms that come from the pain. Also, sometimes people find that they cannot sleep, they cannot eat well when they have so much pain or their mood is down. So these antidepressants may help those other problems as well. So what we're trying to do is to catch as many problems as possible with, again, as few medications as we can manage. But they have various types of side effects because they're different medications. Um, and it depends on your illness and your general health. So different people may find that they're on different types of add-ons. If you're not sure if you should be on an adjuvant pain medication or what type is the best for you, ask your doctor. I sound like those drug commercials now on TV, don't I? <laughs> 
but it is very true because every person is different, right? So we don't want to just say, you know, take this and you'll feel better in the morning. And finally, the last type of pain medication we may use is called the bisphosphonase. These are typically used for people with bony um, involvement, and they are used to prevent uh, vertebral or spinal fracture or other fra bony fractures, and they can help with bony pain. Um, they're cleared by your kidneys, so obviously your doctors have to take that into account when they give you the medication. They're usually given intravenously. I think many of you probably had received it, right? I see some hot heads nodding. Um, so the two common medications we use are either solidronic acid or pimidronate. I think for the myeloma patients, mostly the solidronic acid, actually. Um, side effects, actually not many. There is only sort of one rare but very severe side effect that I want to just mention briefly called osteonecrosis of the jaw. Basically, it's the rotting of the bone in the jaw. And it usually happens if a patient had some kind of dental work done around the time they got the infusion of the medication. So very important that if you're going to have any dental work done, hold off, speak to your hematologist first, let them know that your dentist is thinking about doing some dental work, get that clearance from your, onco your oncologist, hematologist first before going ahead. Or if you're seeing your dentist, remind them that you have myeloma, you're on these medications, you're on the bisphosphonate, so that they also think twice before they go ahead and do anything. So, we talked a lot about medications. When do I actually use medications? I'm sure many of you have been asked, if you have to put a number to your pain, how would you rate it from zero to 10? You probably did, right? And it's sometimes frustrating for people, like, what do you mean? Like, you know, pain is pain, it's bad. Um, or like, you know, you hear someone say, uh, it's a 12 out of 10 pain, it's very, very bad, it's off the chart bad. Um, but we put it up anyways, because sometimes it is helpful if we have a number, it sort of guides us a little bit, you know, are we, are, are we doing the right thing? Are we going in the right direction to help your pain or are we not? Or if you had chronic pain, what was it before and now, what is it if you have a new pain, right? This is helpful for us to differentiate treating chronic pain that is not necessarily cancer related versus new cancer pain that we have to be very careful about. Um, so here we had Charlie Brown helpfully illustrating to us, you know, how different types of pain may look. I separated it into different degrees. So minor pain is usually, if you think about the numbers, zero to three. So low grade pain, that is a minor annoyance. You think about it, but then you can still get on and do your thing, do your business, and you don't have to be hindered by the pain. It doesn't necessarily last very long, and you may or may not need to take medication for them. And that's okay. Those are the type of pain that maybe you can get by with Tylenol uh, or maybe just very low doses of the opioids and you only need to take them as needed. Moderate pain is in the range of four to six. So this is what we call a nagging pain, a pain that's constantly there or it's, it's hanging around for way longer than you want it to. And probably more importantly, it's pain that's stopping you from doing what you want to do. That's usually the tip I tell my patients. Take your medications when the pain is bad enough to stop you in your tracks. If I wanted to go and walk my dog, and now I cannot because I've got pain, or my family wanted to take me out for lunch and I don't want to go out because I, I need to lay down with this pain, this is when you should take your pain medication. Don't wait until it's severe. Because what happens is if you use your medication earlier, there's a much better chance of bringing your pain down low enough that it doesn't bother you again. It brings it back down to the minor pain and it also stays away from you for longer. So you may end up using less medication. If you try to be a martyr and wait until it's a severe pain, you know, anything from seven and up, unfortunately, the moderate pain tends to grow into a severe pain. And what happens when the pain is so severe at the top of the chart? When you take a dose of the pain medication, you may bring it down from a 10 to a nine. Still bad, still not allowing you to do anything. So you take another pill, and then it brings it down from a nine to an eight. Still very bad, still can't do anything. You take another pill. So in the end, what happened? You spent more time suffering from the pain, you took more medications, and you didn't get anywhere ahead because you're still not able to do the things you want. And that is why our patients actually came back and tell us, you know, doc, tell your other patients, don't wait until the pain is bad. And I'm sharing the secret with you today. And you're allowed and welcome to share the secret with other people you know. Don't wait until the pain is bad. Take the medications if it's bad enough to stop you from doing what you want. Because sometimes you need that back-to-back -back doses to 
get the pain down. But again, then you end up taking more medications than you really want to. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Yeah? Okay. We don't want to yell good grief like um, Charlie Brown, right? <laughs> okay. So just quickly finishing up the last couple of slides now. Other than medication, other than self-management, what other things can we do for pain? Um, Dave mentioned in the near future, you get a talk from a radiation specialist. So radiation is one of those very common treatments we use to treat pain. It's very helpful if you have a painful bony or soft tissue involvement. It's given by a radiation oncologist and it's what we call a local treatment. So the effect or the benefit only happens in the area that's treated. So if I had radiation to my shoulder, it's not gonna help my hip pain. That's the bottom line. The side effects are uh, what we call a radiation flare. So the pain can temporarily get worse before it gets better. And it's because radiation causes a local inflammation. So the inflammation, it's how it works on the pain and the cancer, but you have a bit of a worsening pain for a while before it gets down. Sometimes, depending on where the radiation treatment is in your body, you can get tiredness or nausea and vomiting as well. But we have very good medications to treat the nausea. So make sure, if you're going to start on radiation, ask your doctor, should I get some anti-nausea medication? And if you do feel nauseous, same thing like the pain, take your nausea medication. Don't wait until it gets really bad. Um, I'm just gonna finish this one line quickly. Um, the benefit can appear immediately while you're on your radiation treatment, or sometimes there's a lack that it only kicks in after a few weeks. So different persons and different types of cancer or different parts of the body have different res responses to the radiation. Quick question there in the front. Uh, is it correct that radiation is basically not used for myeloma because it is not a solid tumor cancer mm -hmm. and it's fluid, so it's a bit difficult to find. You can't address it. You can't radiate something that's little bits all over your body. So the question was, is radiation an appropriate treatment for myeloma patients? Uh, is it because that the myeloma is felt to be fluid in the body? Well, um, I think we talked about earlier on how people can have bony involvement. So there's a very discreet, very specific spot in the bones that can be painful. So radiation can be helpful. We can target that specific area. Uh, but also some, so, sometimes those soft tissue plasma cytoma, because there's a, a glob of this tumor um, that's causing pain, there's causing pressure, those can also be radiated as well. Has any of you here received radiation? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So another question there in the back? No? The gentleman there? Um, right after I was done. Yes? Did you have a question? Um, so no? Oh, okay, all right, sorry. Okay, good. See, exactly, yeah, you know, uh, it can be given actually in the appropriate setting. Um, but again, this is where your doctors, your oncologists, hematologists would advise you, you know, I think we need to uh, consider radiation. Of course, your healthcare doctor can also suggest that and discuss with your hematologist as well, too. Uh, I think this gentleman first and then over here. Yes. So is it ionizing radiation and does it affect other parts of any other cells that, that are non-cancer cells? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so the question was, was it ionizing, uh, is it ionizing radiation, does it affect other parts of the body and other cells? Again, as we said, it's a local type of treatment, so the effect is only on the part that's been treated. Um, and for that reason, the radiation oncologist, um, their specialty is in making sure that the treatment is localized or focused only through the area that we want to treat. We don't want the spillover through the other part of the body. It is ionizing radiation, um, but they control the dose that is used to treat the uh, area that needs to be treated so that only the problem area gets the biggest dose of radiation for the maximum benefit. Other areas that do not need the radiation, they try to limit it and protect the vital structures. So, one last line on treatment is, you know, vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty. Uh, I noticed as I was looking over on the side um, that Dr. Roger Smith was here uh, before. He's one of our colleagues that we work with very closely, and he's what we call an interventional radiologist. What he does with the vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty is basically a filling in of those bony defects or those fractures with a surgical cement. Uh, and it's very helpful for pain with movement. Because um, right now, a lot of the medications don't match the profile of the pain. Pain with movement comes on very quickly. As soon as you start to move, the pain comes on and then it goes away when you're done. None of the medications we have right now match that rise and the falls is nicely. So then um, filling in the fractures or the defects with the cement actually takes away the pain and you may not even need the medication afterwards. 
Side effects, though, would be, again, after the procedure, you can have a flare in the pain, and then it goes away. Because it goes through your skin, you can have bleeding or infection, but those are very minor risks because Dr. Smith and the other experts are very good at what they do. Um, there is a very rare, but again, could be a very significant side effect of cement leakage down the spinal cord, but it's very, very rare. Um, again, benefit can happen immediately right after the procedure, or it can lag a few weeks afterwards. So finally, as a summary, Palliative Care is a specialized medical service, and it serves patients with different types of life-threatening illness anywhere along their illness journey. And what we do is, by early uh, involvement of palliative care, we can improve the quality of, of life of these patients. And we do that by effective symptom management. And we're looking at a personalized care plan that looks at physical, emotional, psychosocial um, domains of health. And as we all know already, myeloma can cause many different types of pain. But palliative care is often a part of that care team to help myeloma patients manage the pain. We know that could Good pain management can involve both medication, but also non-medication treatments, including self-management, things that you can do for yourself. And also, very importantly, if effective control of pain improves quality of life for our myeloma patients. So with that, I just want to say thank you for all of you for listening, and especially to your invitation, your kind invitation to talk today. Um, I want to mention uh, Mr. Michael Kaxer. Um, I know he was uh, one of the uh, co-chairmen earlier. Michael, I looked after him for a while when he was going through treatment uh, at Princess Margaret and I helped look after his pain. I know he's not with us anymore, but he's a very lovely gentleman and I really thank you to, to him for inviting me and actually connecting me with Dave. And of course, I have to say thank you, big thank you to Dave to uh, help me organize this presentation. Um, he gave me a lot of helpful feedback as we sort of brainstormed together what is the best thing to talk about to help all of us um, here understand a little bit more how pain uh, in myeloma can be managed. And finally, a big shout out to all my awesome, awesome colleagues at uh, the Department of Supportive Care, Princess Margaret Cancer Center. All the doctors, nurses, social workers, pharmacists, therapists, everybody I work with, and all the specialists, including the hematologists that many of you are familiar with, Dr. Sniff, uh, all, all the other specialists that we work with closely. They're all here to help look after all of you myeloma patients. So thank you. Mm. So the question is about radiation and the radiation flare. How long after the treatment can one expect a flare? Usually the flare happens while you're getting the radiation or up to the first week after the treatment. Because again, it's a result of the inflammation you get. So typically it does not go beyond the first week. Um, so if you have pain that seems to be persisting beyond that time, you may need to speak to your doctor, either your radiation doctor or your hematologist. Um, or if you have pain that sort of went away with the radiation and then it came back again in the same spot a few months afterwards, again, would be a reason to speak to your doctor and say, I've got this pain and it's relatively new because it went away and then it's back again. What should we do about it? Mm. The question was, um, this patient has, this lady has the <coughs> peripheral neuropathy um, and it's been long-standing, it sounds like, and on the combination of morphine or opioids plus the um, add-on, the adjuvant. Um, and most days it's quite well managed, but there are times when it flares and quite horribly. Um, and even with all those other self-management techniques we talked about earlier, that wasn't enough, then what do we do? Um, I guess without going into your personal medical history, it's obviously a frustrating and difficult situation, but um, the unfortunate nature of pain is that it does flare up and down. There will be good days and there will be bad days. Um, it's important then to figure out when these bad days or these episodes happen. You know, what could be triggering it? If there's anything that you notice is a pattern, that may be important to sort of report to your doctors and anticipate as well too. Um, and also, uh, it is okay to take more medications on a bad day. Because on a good day, you don't need much medication, then that's, that's great. But on a bad day, if the flare-up is so bad you can't do much, you may need to take a little bit more medication temporarily. And those are the times maybe you need to take more of the short-acting uh, medication. Because the, the lady mentioned she's on the long-acting formulation, which helps with the background pain. But you can still have a flare, what we call a breakthrough pain, right? The pain is breaking through that background control. So if you have that flare, that breakthrough pain, this is what the short-acting medication is meant for. And you can take that as often as your doctor suggests or recommends. But if that doesn't work, that's a good time to, again, speak to the doctor. You know, 
are we on the right track? Is this the right combination for me, or do we need to adjust the medication, uh, the combination a little bit? No. I don't think I answered your question completely, but I hopefully get you started with some ideas. Yeah. Very good question here. The question is, you know, when we um, are on the opioid medications, how do we decide if we have to switch? And when we switch, uh, which one do we go to next? What decides that? Uh, and, you know, when, when do you decide that well, we've been on this medication for long enough or this is a big enough dose that we have to switch? Uh, and the other part of the question was, is there a hierarchy? Is there one that's stronger, one that's not as strong, et cetera, et cetera? Um, so uh, opioid in itself, as I said, is a group of medications. They do have what we call relative potency, meaning, yes, there is a hierarchy of sorts of a weakest pain medication going all the way up to the strongest. The thing though is the word relative, because it's all depending on how much you give. Because if you give a whole lot of a very weak medication, you can get to the same effect as if you give a small amount of something that's very strong, very potent. So it's all relative. Um, and how to decide which medications to start a person on? Um, most of the time we start with the very um, common medication like morphine or codeine, these are the two that we start people on the most often, and codeine actually is probably one of the weaker ones. But when we need to switch, it could be either, as we said earlier, because the pain isn't controlled as we go up on the dose. And commonly too, as we go up on the dose of the medications, when people start to experience side effects. So if there are side effects that are not tolerated, that's also another reason to switch and which one we switch to depends, again, on your kidney and liver function, depends on your general health, depend on whether you have allergies of any sort, depend on your previous experience. A lot of people, if they had surgeries in the past of some sort, might have had some morphine-type medication as well, too. So those are the times that could help us figure out which medication we should use and which one we shouldn't. Because sometimes people, when they have the morphine after surgery, um, they may have a reaction. And that's a good piece of information to tell your doctor, right? This is what happened the last time it got morphine after whatever type of surgery. And that will guide your doctor and nurses a little bit more about which is the right medication. Having said that, the bottom line is still that we don't have the right type of science right now to tell us just looking at the person or even doing a blood test will know which one of that morphine family is the best. So we still have to go through that trial and error um, approach. But what happens is while you're trying different medications, again, if you have side effects or that it doesn't help you, your pain, that's a good piece of information to feed back to your doctors. And that's where keeping the pain diary is helpful because you can say, okay, on a given day, um, I'm using how many doses of the short acting and they're very helpful with my pain. Then your doctor will know, okay, we're on the right track. But if it's not working and you're taking a lot of breakthroughs, that's the signal to us, okay, we either have to go up on the long acting or this is just not the right medication, we have to switch. And again, um, those may be the times too that we think about using the add-ons, the adjuvants, because we don't really want people to need to use a lot of opioids either because of all the side effects. So if we add the adjuvants on, it may allow us to stay with a lower dose of whatever opioid you're on too. So these are all things your doctors and nurses will think about, but it's also something you can suggest and, and ask your doctor, is it something appropriate for me? And why, why is it yes, or why is it not a good choice for me? So two parts um, to, to what you were saying there. Um, opioids do help with nerve pain, just not enough on its own, typically. So I'm, I'm not saying uh, by any means that you should not stay on opioids when you have nerve pain. It's just that usually we find that people who are only on opioids are not getting the, the same relief as if they were on a combination of different types of medications together. Um, so, you know, for some people, if their neuropathic pain is not very severe, they may be able to get by with just low doses of, of opioids too. But typically we need a combination is what I'm seeing. Um, you're absolutely right that though, the different adjuvants, the different add-ons, they are different medications again. So it could be well that one medication doesn't work well for your nerve pain and we have to try another one in that same bigger group of add-ons or adjuvants. So that's certainly a possibility too. Um, 
you mentioned Lyrica. Lyrica is the brand name to pregabalin. So uh, I list on my slides just the generic name for gabapentin and pregabalin. They're two different medications, but they're related. So the idea is similar to the opioids. They can be related, but people can also react differently because they are different chemicals. So it could mean sometimes a switch in drugs is needed. But it, again, depends on sort of the overall health. Um, again, as I mentioned, they have different types of side effects. Um, they are cleared either by your liver or kidneys or both. Um, so it also depends on these other factors as well. So it's, uh, I guess that's why I'm working. That's why I have a job, right? So that I actually can talk to people, in my opinion, with everything that affects you and your general health, I think these are the, the, the best, best medication to try. There was one question that um, came up uh, through different people during the rest uh, the break period is how do I get connected or refer to palliative care? Um, I, I mean, you know, after what I talked about palliative care, everybody's like, oh, that's all well and good. How do I get in on that? Um, actually, with most cancer programs or regional cancer centers, they typically have a palliative care program there as well. Uh, and again, it's a team, as I said. They could be a consultant um, to your oncologist or hematologist. They may um, either have a surface where they see patients as they get admitted into the hospital, so as an inpatient, or some uh, palliative care programs have an outpatient program in that they have clinics that you can meet the doctors in. Um, but different hospitals or different cancer programs have uh, have different different uh, setups, so not all the centers have the same sort of support. So it's important to just ask your hematologist how can I get referred to palliative care and you know, what kind of service do we, do we have here? So the question is, what is the maximum dose of Tylenol? For most people, um, the maximum amount of Tylenol, Tylenol is four grams a day or 4,000 milligrams for a normal person with normal liver function. So that's equivalent to uh, eight tablets of your extra strength or about 12 of the regular strains. But um, as the person gets older, we tend to be a bit more conservative and be a bit more careful, even if the liver function looks all right on the blood test. For people a bit older, probably 65 and older, we would suggest maybe cutting down to three grams per day. So that's six tablets of the extra strains, about 10 of the uh, regular strains. But again, it depends on your overall health. So it's good to check with your doctor to say, you know, what is the maximum dose I can, I can use. Is it the same for Advil or ibuprofen or is it just for the acetaminophen? Mm. Just for the Tylenol, just for the acetaminophen. So uh, Advil or ibuprofen is a totally different medication, so there's a different total daily dose that you can take safely. And that also, again, can depend on your kidney function this time. So uh, if in doubt, check with your doctors. Very good questions. Um, I don't know if I have all the answers for you. The first question was, you know, what type of dental procedure is important when we think about the bisphosphonate, this electronic acid? Um, is something like capping of the tooth important or is it more like the extraction, like taking out a, a tooth? Uh, and I would say probably the more invasive type, like where you have to take out a, a tooth, is more important because it disrupts the bony structure of the jaw itself. And of course, now you have a gaping hole, basically. Uh, whereas if you put a cap on a tooth, there's really no injury or, or uh, stress to the jaw itself, so it should be all right. Always best to check with the dentist and your hematologist anyways, but you're, you're probably correct in that the minor type of surgeries, cleaning is not a problem, right? Your regular cleaning is not an issue at all. But major extractions, uh, those are the things you have to check with your doctors. Um, plus also, I guess there's an infection risk too, because again, if you extract a tooth, there is an open sore now that can put you at risk for infection. Uh, the second piece was, uh, is there an accumulative sort of dose effect with this electronic acid. Does it matter how long I've been on it or how short? And for that, I think I have to check. I can't tell you right off the top of my head. My guess is probably uh, the longer you're on, the higher the risk. Having said that, I've, I've also seen patients where they ended up with that very rare but severe complication, the osteonecrosis of the jaw, uh, even after a relatively short time on this electronic acid, but they also had a dental extraction recently. So it could be those things all playing together uh, and not necessarily how long or how short they've been on it. So I don't have a definite answer for you, 
probably good to check with the dentist at the cancer center because they are the expert on that. Um, uh, and I think you had a third piece to your question. Oh, was it the upper jaw and the lower jaw? Yes, um, Yeah, mostly I've seen it in the lower jaw, but I don't think there's anything to say it won't happen to the upper jaw, because again, it's about disrupting the bony structure uh, and <clears throat> that you are using the medication, solidronic acids and IV infusion, so it's throughout your body. So I, I suppose theoretically it can happen in the upper jaw. Whether or not that happens more commonly than the lower jaw or vice versa, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Okay. Very good question. Um, the question was, would medical cannabis or marijuana be helpful for pain or for other some of the side effects that people experience uh, with myeloma or cancer in general? Um, you notice I deliberately didn't put that into my presentation because that in itself is another one hour talk. Um, however, I guess the, sh the short version of that is right now there isn't enough research to support medical cannabis helps significantly in cancer related pain. And most of the research that we have even is in the solid tumor, so in the lung, breast cancer, etc. Not so much in the blood type cancer. I don't even think there is any research done in myeloma patients specifically about medical cannabis and its effect on them. So I would say um, not right now. It would be one thing that I can consider if we've exhausted all other options. Um, the research that we have right now on medical cannabis for pain, it's mostly done on patients with, uh, with chronic pain that is not cancer related. And even then they say there's only a moderate amount of benefit. So it's definitely not uh, the panacea that we've been, we've been told or heard about. Um, so we know that chronic non-cancer pain is very different from cancer pain. So right now we cannot say specifically for cancer pain and then even smaller into uh, myeloma pain whether this is relevant or not. In my personal experience, and it's the same experience for all my colleagues at the healthcare team at Princess Margaret, we are quite underwhelmed by medical cannabis in its effect. When we use it for pain, we can consider it, but it would be our fourth or fifth choice just because we have so many other things that work so much better for people. And when people say they're very interested and they want to try it, we help them get access to it. But again, the feedback has been mostly not very helpful or that if it did help, it was only a minor degree. Um, so a lot of people are thinking of using medical cannabis in the hopes of decreasing the use of their opioids. So far, I haven't seen that in real life in my patients, and I haven't seen that proven in the research either. However, of course, with more interest now, there is a change in that there are more research that will be done in medical cannabis. So perhaps down the road, and I would say maybe in the next 10 years, we'll hear a little bit more about it. Uh, and perhaps at that point, our recommendations can change. But at this current time, not really. Yeah, so the question is uh, not from pain, but using medical cannabis for nausea. For that, we may consider it uh, more often than if we consider it for pain. There is some research actually for cannabis using cannabis for nausea from chemo. Um, but again, it's probably mostly done on patients who are getting chemotherapy for solid tumors, not for the blood type cancers. Um, also, again, the research was done mostly using a chemical that's made by a drug company. So it's a prescription medication. Not a lot of research is actually done on the plant, the medical cannabis itself, because it's been illegal for so many years in many places, right? So there actually isn't research specifically into using the actual plant product, whether you're smoking it, vaporizing it, using the oil or eating the plant itself. Right now, not enough evidence to suggest that. However, we have suggested to patients if they've tried the usual anti nausea medication and have found no benefit, um, or not enough benefit that we can consider medical cannabis with all the caveat that we talked about earlier. The major side effects that you have to realize though for cannabis is drowsiness, sedation. So a lot of people uh, don't really want to be more sedated than they already are. So that can be one thing to consider. And of course, you know, cannabis 
it affects people differently, just like pain medication, just like opioids. For some people, they feel very relaxed and calm, but there have also been people where they feel more anxious or high right, or euphoric to the point where they lose control. And then in the rare situations, people have uh, gone into a psychotic episode where they have hallucinations and they're very agitated. So it certainly affects people across that whole spectrum. Um, that's where we, we um, suggest caution when we try the medication. These are the things we have to watch out for. So again, deviating a little bit from today's talk on pain, um, fatigue in itself, again, oh, actually all of these can be another separate talk. Um, fatigue, I think somebody else came up to me and asked about that earlier in the break as well. Really what we talked about here in self-management, staying physically active is probably the best thing you can do for fatigue. There are, of course, medications you can try to help with physical type of fatigue, but then most of the research suggests that staying physically active works better than any medications we can prescribe. And of course, with any medications, there are treatment effects, but then there are side effects. So we have to balance the two sides as well. Um, if you're dealing with a mental type of fatigue, so meaning sort of difficulty in concentrating or focusing in attention, uh, you're reading the same line over and over, or you fall asleep when you watch TV, that's a different type of fatigue. And again, we have medication for that. Um, most of the time, it's about what we call energy conservation. So using your energy wisely for the things that you want to do that are enjoyable, that are important to you. And if you feel tired, rest and do something else later on after you've rested. Um, and then if it really interferes with your function, then perhaps we can consider medication for the mental fatigue. And it's usually a, a, a stimulant like Ritalin. But then of course, they have their own side effects and we can talk about that too. The question is, uh, is there enough people going into pain management um, as a medical specialty? I think in the last few years, there's definitely been an increased interest in that. Um, pain management can, can be done by many different types of specialists. Certainly, healthcare is a specialized area where we focus on symptom management and pain is one of the symptoms. So in a way, we are an expert in managing pain, but it's not the only type of symptom we manage. There are, however, special uh, uh, how should I put it, actual pain specialists that focus only on pain, this one symptom. And most of the time they are anesthetists. Um, so these are doctors who are very good with um, doing procedures, nerve blocks, that sort of thing. So their approach is mostly in looking at um, non-medication ways to help with the pain by blocking the nerve or, or freezing the nerve or even sometimes killing the nerve. But other times they also suggest medications and they tend to uh, look after patients with chronic non-cancer pain. So the type of medications they typically use are the adjuvants, the add-ons. They try to not use the opioids, the morphine family. Um, because currently the treatment guidelines for chronic non-cancer pain suggest not using the opioids as much as possible because of that opioid misuse crisis that we're all hearing about every day in the news. Cancer pain, however, is a different type of pain, as we said earlier. So there are cancer pain specialists as well, and they can be anesthetists, they can be um, healthcare doctors, and sometimes they can just be an internist who have an interest in that. And we would definitely have um, an expertise in using different types of medication, but we also, uh, someone who can connect you or refer you to the other specialists like anesthetist who does a nerve block, to a radiation specialist who does radiation, uh, or interventional radiologist who does kyphoplasty, etc. So we're the ones sort of look at all the other different specialties that can help treat the type of pain you have, depending on where your pain is, what type of pain it is, what medications have worked or not worked for you. Yeah. There is a rising number of trainees uh, who go into the healthcare program happily. Um, I can definitely say that because in the last few years, I've seen a lot more um, learners coming through, whether they're medical students interested in palliative care or residents uh, who actually want to go into the fellowship learning to be a palliative care specialist. And then along the anesthetist side, there are now anesthetists who go into a special fellowship, so an additional training program focusing on pain. And they can be just a chronic pain type of specialist or a cancer pain specialist. So I think overall there is a rise in interest. Maybe it speaks to um, our population in general that we, we do have a, an older and aging population. People live longer with chronic illnesses because we're better at managing them. But of course then people accumulate more pain along the way, whether it's from other non-cancer illnesses or cancer. So we probably do need better um, expertise in managing pain. 
I would say that, however, um, family doctors, because I'm a family doctor myself by training, is also an important player in this because a lot of the chronic non-cancer pain patients are followed by their family doctors. And we should, you know, this is part of my job to uh, teach the family medicine trainees better way to manage the pain and appropriate way to prescribe medication so we don't head into yet another opioid crisis. Thank you.